Hey team, welcome back to another episode of the Strength Game Podcast. I'm your host, Nick O'Brien, and this is episode number 10. The Strength Game is a weekly podcast dedicated to discussing all things physical culture with the athletes, coaches, iron enthusiasts, and experts deeply embedded in the strength game on both sides of the profession, both as coaches and as competitive athletes. I want to thank those of you who have liked, shared, commented, and subscribed to the show. Your continued support allows us to bring on expert guests and highlight more individuals just like our guest today. And I'm excited to have on another fellow Iron Hoya alumni and my inaugural CSCCA roommate, Cam Williams. Cam is the head strength, speed, and conditioning coach at Seattle University, working with men's basketball, men's soccer, volleyball, softball, rowing, and track and field. He's a former two-sport athlete in college, an avid training enthusiast himself with previous competitive experience in both powerlifting and strongman, and is now training in weightlifting. Like I said, I'm excited to have him on the show today. So with all that said, let's get into the game with Cam Williams. All right, what's going on, everybody? I'm here with my friend and uh, former Iron Hoya with me back in 2011, the good times, uh, Cam Williams. <laughs> He's the head strength, speed, and conditioning coach at Seattle University, working with way too many teams right now. Uh, men's basketball, men's soccer, volleyball, softball, rowing, and the entire track and field team. He's a former dual sport athlete in college, uh, playing basketball and track and field at Washington University in St. Louis. And he's an avid lover and enthusiast of training, both competing in powerlifting and strongman in your career. Hey, man, I'm excited to have you on the show. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having me. Good to talk hey, to you as well. It's been too long. I know. it was. We had the Iron Hoyas reunion, so it's nice to have a little spin-off break room here. Absolutely. Hey, so like I said, you've, you've been competing in sports. You've been playing all your life, and you've been training a lot. But what kind of really got you started um, leading up into college playing both sports? What made you choose both sports? And then uh, what's your training kind of been like post-college to your career now? So uh, the story I always like to tell people, what, what got me into training. So I've been, like you said, I've been an athlete my whole life. Um, I started lifting, doing strength training on some level when I was about 12 years old, like in my bedroom, push-ups, squats, all that kind of stuff. My dad, I don't know if you guys have ever seen like, uh, or if you've ever seen, uh, what's the movie? Uh, like Baby Boy or stuff like that. They had the old like, weight set with the plates filled with sand like my dad had that in the basement so I broke with that in high school but really got what really got me going was uh when I got to college I was a walk-on I was 6'1 maybe 150 pounds if I had just eaten lunch uh and my coach basically said you will not see the floor until you put on 20 pounds and that's kind of when I fell in love with the weight room uh as far as my training post college um so I played, uh, like you said, I played uh, basketball, track in college. So I was real big into explosive stuff then. Kind of got into Olympic weightlifting a little bit then. Not a whole lot of really fundamental instruction. Uh, but after I got out of uh, uh, out of college, I played a little bit of uh, summer league rec ball in uh, Miami. Uh, met some people who were in the training scene there. They kind of taught me a little bit more about weightlifting. I was a high school teacher at the time, which is kind of random. Uh, so I started working with the football team, football coaches like, Hey, uh, you know, there's a career in training athletes. And I'm like, Oh, so you want, I don't have to do grading anymore. That sounds amazing. Go to DC to get my graduate degree, run into great guys like Nick, uh, other great guys at Georgetown, like Carl Johnson, uh, Sean Foster, Mike Hill. They really got me deep in the, uh, in the, the iron Hoyas tradition of training of just barbell training. And ever since then, I kind of fell in love with the basics, which is squat, deadlift, press, row, Olympic movements and strongman training. Like I, I've been sticking to the basics ever since then. And it's, it's served me very well. It's how I coach my athletes now. That's awesome. You kind of answered my next question too, because uh, you did take a very unique path and, you you were the high school teacher. You were a, you were a lab tech at one time, right? I was a lab. Yeah, I had to do that. I, I my my the, 
one of the big things I like to teach my, my college athletes now is that whatever you leave college doing, that's probably not what you're going to end up doing for the rest of your life. So my job history, uh, I graduated from Washington University in St. Louis. I was, so if you remember back when you were in elementary school and there was that guy that brought animals into your classroom. So my undergraduate degree is in environmental science. Uh, I worked for a nature center for a couple months and did animal presentations. So I'd bring like cockroaches and giant spiders and snakes into people's classrooms. I did that. Uh, I moved to Miami because my girlfriend was living there at the time. Uh, she was a middle school teacher. I started as a high school sub just because I had a science background. Became a science teacher, did that for three years, told you guys how I kind of, while I was playing ball down there, got into the training scene down there. Um, decided I was going to go back and be a strength coach. Didn't have a degree in it, so I wanted to get my master's. Went to GW, uh, got into their exercise science program to help pay for that. I was a, a GA in their lab, so I actually am probably one of the few uh, head strength coaches you'll run into now whose GA ship had nothing to do with strength and conditioning. Um, I was taking like body fat measurements and doing VO2 max measures in, uh, in GW's lab. Uh, and while I was there, had to get some internship hours, and that's kind of when I fell in with the with, George, with the Georgetown crew, and the rest, as they say, is history. That's awesome. Yeah, you've got a plethora of, of background. It makes it interesting, though, because you got so many different stories that you can actually share with your athletes, and that's a great that's a great piece of advice, too, saying, hey, you might not be doing exactly what your degree is in, and some, I know a lot of kids, especially ones that take general studies and stuff like that, like, what are you going to use with that? So to be able to at least find a way to kind of find your passion out of it, you can still rely on some of those experiences, which is awesome. And it's kind of funny that you've dabbled in everything in the coaching side and then in your career, because you also dabble a lot in your strength training. And especially like competing that I'm waiting for you to do the big three. Cause now you've done, you've done strongman powerlifting. Now you got to do a weightlifting meet just to kind of round it out. So I have been dragging my feet on that. I've done powerlifting. Like you said, I've done strongman. I've actually been over the last couple of years, mainly focusing on weightlifting in my training. It's just, it's, I mean, people in the strength training world know like it's super highly technical and there's, there's something like really, uh, drawing about the, te the technical aspect of that. Uh, but I, I've gotten busy as a Division One head strength coach. So I have time to actually schedule a competition, but it will happen. I'm going to make that happen. Nice. I'm looking forward to seeing it, man. I want to see what your total is because you're, I think you're always, I think by the time you're 70, you're still going to be able to dunk. That's the plan. That's awesome. I mean, the day I can't dunk, I feel like it's just over. Like I, I, I'll just call it a, a life at that point. I'm done. <laughs> I know your Hoopers probably love that too, which is awesome. Hey, so kind of talking about um, you competing in multiple sports and then multiple strength sports, what has that kind of taught you and kind of how can you apply that as a coach? Because now you're dealing with kids at the college level that I don't, you probably don't have anybody that's a multi-sport athlete. So like drawing on your experience, how has that helped your coaching and then um, how you train them for one sport now? I think the the biggest thing is it's given it's and it's honestly the thing I feel like they miss. I completely agree to be an athlete at the highest level. At some point, you have to specialize, but there's something to be said for very general training that applies to everything. And I think one of the cool things about my background is since I have such a broad breadth of things, I get to pick out the things like what's something that reappears every single sport, every single discipline wherever you are. Um, the biggest example just comes to mind, uh, so like the power position in a clean. That's a position that you see in Olympic weightlifting. It's a position that is necessary for strongman. It's a position where you have to be strong in for powerlifting. It's your athletic position for basketball and volleyball. So being able to see those, those commonalities appear in multiple places, I think that's the most useful thing to me. And saying, okay, if it pops up everywhere, then as an athlete, for your base, that's something you should have. No, definitely. I think, I mean, we already know that most of the main movements are, they're going to help anybody in any sport across it. You need, you need a certain base level of strength, mobility, stability, and, and control. So, I mean, most of those movements are going to be easy to find. You need to be able to push, pull, squat, hinge, carry, lunge, like 
It's just how you apply it, the dosage, the volume, when, how often, and then that tie into sport. I mean, everybody's going to be able to, in some part, benefit from those things. And even if you're not playing sport either. So that's awesome. Um, now going back to, I wanted to touch on one of your former positions at Vassar college where there may be some people that are training multiple sports, but for you, you were a one man army essentially. Uh, can you talk a little bit about like the wide variety and the experience that you got from there and give a little bit of background for people that don't know about Vassar college, so what it was a, all about. It's ironic. I it's, and you, and you get this as a strength coach. As a strength coach, you travel around the country and you just accrue gear. So obviously, I can't wear this to work anymore, but it's still a really comfortable T-shirt. So I have all this like old gear from like Georgetown Ambassador that I still wear. So it's ironic I'm wearing a Vassar T-shirt. Uh, but background for, for anybody who doesn't know, Vassar is a uh, Division three program in Poughkeepsie, New York. Um, very, very highly academic. They're trying to build their athletic program. For anybody who doesn't know, uh, Division three sports on the East Coast are pretty big. Uh, NESCAC schools are real big out there. Uh, so Vassar is not in that conference, but trying to compete with those schools. Uh, very interesting situation for me. It was my first head position after leaving Georgetown. Uh, easiest way to sum it up, Vassar has 23 sports and one strength coach. That's the easiest way to sum it up. So any way you've seen a, a, a weight room run on any other college campus, that's not how Vassar runs because you just can't do it that way. Uh, but honestly, one of the most amazing things about that experience for me was being able to sit down in front of a bunch of coaches. Like I said, 23 different sports. Obviously, you had things like swimming that were technically two different, technically two programs and one coach. But uh, sit down in front of a bunch of head coaches and basically sell them on look. I cannot, as one human being, write a one program for all of your different teams. It's impossible. I can't, that would, that would not be something that'd be beneficial to everybody. But it was really the time that kind of solidified my idea that like, look, a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be training, it's the same for everybody. No, none, of the, none of your athletes are weightlifters. None of your athletes compete in strongman. None of your athletes compete in powerlifting. We are using these things as tools to build them for other sports. So at the end of the day, I'm just, uh, developing power and strength that's transferable i'm I, what i told the athlete i told the head coaches and the athletes is hey i'm gonna give you raw ability i'm gonna give you the ability to generate force and power what you do with it that's what you do in practice but my job is to to develop that ability in you and one of the cool things about vassar because it is a fairly open-minded place was that the coaches really bought in um and my my favorite thing about that especially since it's division three and for people who don't know uh, strength and conditioning in the off season at the division three level is optional. You can't require those workouts of athletes. So one of my, my, honestly, my, my, my favorite things about that is when I first started at Vassar, I started keeping attendance, how many people were coming through the weight room, starting off with about two to 300 people per week. Like that's people coming multiple times, but over the course of the week, I had 200, two to 300 visits. By the time I left, there were days I had more than 200 athletes come through the weight room in a day. And that was that that made me feel really happy. That's awesome. Yeah, because I'm thinking 23 sports, it's got to be well over 500 student athletes. I, I think we were pushing 500. Yeah, because there and I know there there's a few sports that aren't necessarily varsity, but club level too. Were you working with those as well? I did. So we have uh, probably the two that are kind of or probably three yeah not two that were interesting so we had squash and fencing which there is some ncaa level competition but they don't really do divisions because there aren't that many teams for them but then we also had uh men's and women's rowing and men's and women's rugby uh which were technically club sports and i worked with them as well uh, a lot of my a lot of some of my favorite lifters i worked with were on the rowing team and the, uh, and the rugby team rugby that was my first introduction to rugby and that was uh interesting that's awesome yeah most people don't get the opportunity to work with teams like that. And, and obviously you're the one man show, like we said, so it's kind of hard to, to give every single team what you had. And I think you did an awesome job of, of relaying that information to the head coaches and still making them each athlete, each team feel important and not kind of pushed off to the side and not just giving them a cookie cutter program, but you worked well within your dimensions, what you were capable of doing without doing, like over burning yourself out. Um, 
I know you, you said the D3 model. I I played at a D3 school and and I coached at one too. And that off season period is where you either win championships or you just get lost in the shuffle of another D3 school. Um, being by yourself and everything too probably makes it more difficult. How'd you kind of motivate those athletes? What was the change between 200 athletes coming in in a week now up till you leaving and taking another position to 200 athletes a day? What did you do that was different that kind of drew athletes in? How'd you motivate them? How'd you kind of take command of that position? So it's, it's, it's funny. I've had a number of people kind of ask me that, and I don't know if I have like the best answer for how each person should do it. But I think honestly, and I think some of that's happened as well since I've been at Seattle U, uh, is that for me, the biggest thing is I love to lift. I love being in the weight room and I want it to be fun. And at the end of the day, I remember that as much as I want to be a weightlifter and a powerlifter, that's not what my athletes are. They're not weightlifters and they're not powerlifters. So I really have to make a fun and needs to be productive, needs to be organized. You need to have set rules. Like when people break your rules, I was real big on like, like I had open sessions where athletes from different teams could come in and then people knew if you showed up late to an open session, Cam was going to call you out. He was going to ask you why you were late. And depending on what your excuse was going to be, he was going to sign a punishment that you were going to do in front of everybody because of it. But I always kept the mood light enough where I'm like, I never want this to be a place you don't want to be because this isn't your sport. I want you to come train in a sport that's not what you do for your benefit. So if I make it too heavy, you're just not going to come. So I kept it fun. And for me, that was easy because the weight room is where I go to have fun. So I basically just, I, I did what I wanted to do every day and people seemed to like it, which worked out well for me. <laughs> yeah, that makes it a lot easier when, when you're so passionate about it and the athletes can kind of see it. And they, they want, it's infectious, so they want to be around for those open ones. I know like Carl does the same thing with his barbell clubs in the morning and he probably gets a better turnout for that at 6 a.m. than the mandatory sessions. I will forever say, um, I, one, just shout outs. Awesome. Thank you forever to, to Mike Hill, like for putting me in a position to actually be successful. I would not be the person I am if it weren't for Mike Hill. So I have to say that. But one of the things I always say is that from a training standpoint, I am a Carl Johnson disciple. <laughs> I, I, loved, I loved the way Carl coached at Georgetown, and I think I will forever emulate that. I like that. Yeah, I, I thank all those guys, Sean and, and Carl and Hill. Those guys were huge in my development too. You, that's a perfect, though, because you are a Carl disciple. Carl is the ultimate dabbler. He knows yes. everything and he's done every sport, and he knows how to coach every sport, and he's participated in every strength sport. That's why I'm saying you got you got to do weightlifting just to, to add the next one, maybe Moss Wrestling, maybe come join me in Highland Games next. Dude, I watch some of your videos, and, and if nothing else, it just looks like fun. <laughs> it's way too much fun. I mean, yeah. anything where you get to be outside, that was a nice thing, too, for Highland Games is – you can train outside. I mean, we all like, we both love to train and be in the weight room and that it's that grungy environment. I, I would train in a dungeon all day if I had the choice, but eventually you kind of have to step outside. So to go throw rocks in a field and listen to bagpipes and maybe have a pint or two, you can't really beat it. It, it brings you back and it makes you think like, People like to imagine that strength training is a new thing, but people have been trying to get stronger forever. And to me, that's like, it's like, no, I'm just going to see, I'm going to be the guy that picks up the biggest thing and throws it the furthest. Exactly. I, I love it. I love the strength history. <laughs> yeah. And, and those like Highland games and strongman, maybe more Highland games, just because you can compete in it longer. There's master's classes up to like, I think 75 years old. That's awesome. Like when you, when you're doing any of those sports, and you're not competing at like a world-class level. You're not a top 10 guy. Like I'll compete at the national level, but still I'm, for the most part, I'm paying my own way for everything. You're paying your fee, you're paying your hotel, you're paying your travel. Like the people that are going to those things are the ones that love it. You don't train for it all the time. 
to blow your whole weekend in a random city to go lift and potentially get yourself hurt <laughs> unless you love it. So th that's, that's the best part about it. By it's far. one of my, my favorite things about the strength sport world in general is like you said, like everybody is there because that's what they love to do. And they like to share that with other people. And it's just, it's every, it's, it's why I need to do, like you said, I need to do weightlifting. Every strongman competition I went to, the environment was amazing. Every powerlifting competition I went to, the environment was amazing. I can only imagine weightlifting is the same type of way. It's just, it's a, it's a, it's a cool community. Yeah. And it's, even though they're individual sports and you get scored separately, the community, the camaraderie that you guys all have, I mean, you all put everything in to compete against each other, but you're really competing against yourself and trying to set your own record. So, I mean, I'd rather win a competition knowing I did my best and come dead fucking last rather than to just smoke everybody and compete at my worst that day. And the cool thing about that is even the guy or gal who's coming in, like you said, dead fucking last, the person who's coming in first is probably still cheering for that person. And yeah. you, it's very rare you see that in other sports. And that's, that's always – everybody wants everybody to PR – Unless you're trying to win the competition that day. <laughs> yeah, that's that's where it starts to kind of eat at you in the inside when you're right there. It's like, oh, that was a good lift. It was a really good lift. But that's going to be hard for me to beat. That hurts me just a little bit. <laughs> we're all we're always going to try to look for that competitive edge. I mean, exactly. You're you're still in it to win it, too. So, hey, that's a that's a good segue to kind of what I want to talk about. Um, you right now you're not training specifically for a strength sport. I, like you said, you are doing a lot more weightlifting derivatives and, and kind of tempered your training in that environment. But I know you like to train, but what really drives your own training when you don't have a goal in mind? Like what kind of makes you get in there on the days that you, you don't want to do it? So I say this line to my athletes just to drive home to them how completely insane I am. What I say is I wake up every morning slightly frustrated because I know that there are forces in the universe that are stronger than I am. Period. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's one of those things where uh, I think I watch uh, a couple too many. Uh, uh, I, wa I read a couple too many comic books. I watched a couple too many superhero things, too much anime when I was a little kid. And I was like, well, I don't plan on uh, on jumping into a vat of uh, of radioactive liquid anytime soon. So until then, I got to keep training, get stronger, and uh, get these superpowers I've always wanted. <laughs> I like that, and you you said it basically in the first sentence too. Like from what your own personal benefit from training and all the experience and and all the qualities you get from it, you immediately tie it right into your athletes, which is awesome. Like so. I know you, how does your training affect them? Like, do, do you ever go through different swings? Like at one point when you were doing strongman and one point you were doing powerlifting specifically, since now you're doing weightlifting, does some of the stuff that you do with your athletes direct, is it directly influenced from what you're currently training? Absolutely. I mean, I, I it's, I, I like to think of myself, and this is probably me being a little bit arrogant, but I say I'm, I'm both Dr. Frankenstein and his monster. So if, uh, if I'm going to try and try something on my athletes, general, I, better way to say it, I tell my athletes, any program you are currently running is probably what I ran eight months ago and perfected on myself, and now I'm running it on you. Um, so I used to try and say, oh, no, 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 my, my programming for myself doesn't affect my athletes, but it does. It's where you get to try out things, where you get to try out ideas that you have on a small test subject, and then you, you move it on to your athletes. So when I was doing a lot more powerlifting, my athletes were doing more powerlifting. When I was doing more strongman, my athletes were doing more strongman. It's honestly kind of worked out well for me currently, given the environment with COVID, that I'm in a weightlifting right now. So I can bring, I can bring a barbell and plates anywhere on campus to train. And I told my athletes a couple of weeks when we got started, it's like, hey, guess what? Y'all gonna get real good at cleaning this year. We gonna get real good at cleaning because we can put a barbell on plates anywhere and, and we can, we'll clean it to our shoulders. We can press it, we can squat it, we can row, we can do all those things and we don't have to have a rack. Um, so right now we're doing a lot of uh, uh, weightlifting, but 
I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Cause again, like I said, it, it gives you a time to, to try out your things before you try them on your athletes. Yeah. I love that. I mean, as strength coaches, you should be N equals one. You, you're your own test subject. You're the, your own study and we should guinea pig ourselves. And yeah, my, I know my training personally too. It, it reflects what I put in the athletes program to a degree, but it really is to just test out like, Oh man, this is how I feel. Uh, they might be better athletes, but I'm better at this. So, and and then you, you kind of just get in your own head and you tweak your training a lot to mimic it before they get it. And I, I know you're the same way as me. You would never give your athletes something that you've never done before. Yeah, that's awesome. And I know that they're going to be involved doing a lot of cleans this year, a lot of a lot of <laughs> lifting, because like you mentioned. Like with your barbell, you can move, take a barbell and plates anywhere. So for those that don't know, explain what your COVID, your beginning COVID recipe was with your cart before you started deadlifting in the apartment. So I, I, can, I, can, I can do you one better. So if you look behind me, there's my prized possession. And you can kind of see behind the, that, that bar sitting on the floor behind it. Uh, that is the, the hashtag barbell wagon. Uh, so the beginnings of my, my COVID training uh, were when I started seeing the writing on the wall that like sports was gonna shut down and they were gonna close my weight room. Uh, I panicked, I bought a barbell, I bought some plates. I might've borrowed a couple more plates from, uh, from Seattle U's weight room. Uh, and I threw them all in a garden wagon and I would drag them out to a high school football field behind my apartment and I would do what I could with that. So I think I went from March, so whenever we shut down in late March, to whenever I got back in my weight room in July, anything I squatted, I had to clean first. Um, so if I went heavy, it was a deadlift. Uh, that was my big strength work. Um, but it was, it's weird because it was honestly really useful because it reminded me just how much you can get done with just a barbell. Like, I, I feel like I, I got better. So when I, when I got back to, uh, to Racco again, well, the first thing I did was back squat. So I was just like, Oh my God, I haven't been under a bar in so long. Like I'm just like fiending for it. Um, but the first week back, I think I squatted 350, 365 and I hadn't back squat in months, uh, but I'd been squatting and it showed me just being able to practice that movement. And even at a relatively light intensity and just get like, you told, you said, you kind of gave it away. I got to a point where I started lifting in my studio apartment. Cause I'm like, Oh, I can just set up in here and do stuff here and just not drop it. But just, I've probably done more squats and deadlifts in the just volume wise in the last year than I had done in the last like six or seven years, most of them less than 60%, but just being able to practice the technique, it, it, it's been, it reminded me of just how important the basics are. Yeah. You hit the nail on the head. It, it goes to show you can get a lot done with very little and it's nice to have all the bells and whistles and all the new stuff. And I know I'm a, I collect way too much gear and it's just strong man stupidity. I like everything and having my hands on weird stuff, but the stuff is cool. <laughs> it is. But at the end of the day, you really don't need that much stuff to get strong. You can get strong with one kettlebell. You can get strong with one barbell. There are plenty of things you can do. And, and that's awesome. That's the perfect holiday gift idea for anybody looking to get something. You just need, what is it? It's a garden, a garden so sled. I feel like, I feel like I, they should be paying me at this point. Cause I actually had to buy two more of these for our weight room for like our mobile workouts. Uh, but it's the gorilla carts garden shed boys rated up to 800 pounds. I, I can, I can vouch that I have pushed 550 pounds uphill in this thing. And that is a workout in and of itself. Just, just doing that. Uh, but yeah, that's no, been, it's been awesome. Oh man. That gives me flashbacks to pushing the cart up the hill at Georgetown. To put, <laughs> like when, when we took all the plates and the prowlers out to the field, I, I remember that. See, and people don't realize cause now it's all nice. Cause like the new McDonough is down at the bottom of the hill and that's nice. People forget that the weight room used to be up at Yates at the top of the hill and we had to bring everything up and down. <laughs> And then once you get in the building, you go down the elevator and you push it across without anybody seeing on yeah. top of the basketball courts. 
Yeah, very quiet. <laughs> very quiet. Hey, so one of the ones things I really wanted to ask you because we kind of got on the topic of it, and you you had one idea, and you said that like being a guinea pig yourself and trying your stuff out, and you're doing a program well in advance of what you're going to give the athletes. On top of that, what would you say are some some of the main things, main reasons why it's important for a coach to continuously be training? It's so I'll actually throw a caveat in there. I used to be, I used to say, as a strength coach, you have to train. Current other full time at Seattle University, she does not train as often as I do. I can say that, but she is one of the most amazing coaches I've ever seen. And I think that for a lot of us, I'd say the majority of us, it's where we can really get our thinking and analyzing done. So I don't know about how it is for you, but like, I love, I love strength sports. So when I get home at night, I turn on my TV, I'm putting on YouTube. Like, speaking of which, because this happened today, did y'all see Lasha's total? Good God. Like, the man snatched 222. It's insane. Like, we don't have to go back to that. I know that's not what this podcast is about, but I, I'm still stuck on that today. But like, for me, I'll watch stuff like that at night. And then when I go in the next day, like that's when I'm, I'm trying that out when I'm on the weight room floor. I'm like, okay, let me see if I, can, if, if I can take what Lasha did and apply that to my training, and then I can apply that to my coaching. Um, my, my, the other full-time at Seattle U, I have never seen anybody in the strength world who breaks down video the way she does. And what it's made me think is the biggest thing is you either need to be under the bar analyzing it, or you need to be on video analyzing extra hard um, and just like, cause it's, it's, and I think what, where that comes from is there's a lot of science that goes into training, but the practitioners, and this is a weird thing about strength training, we're actually ahead of the, the science. So we have to take the excite, the science and extrapolate it. And you can't do that unless you're either trying it yourself or you're constantly analyzing data from other people. I like that. I, I never thought of it that way that we essentially are ahead of it. We, we test stuff out way in advance before we actually can get an official study put together or I mean, we, we know that those, those journals are either the research has probably been done years before we've already known about it. We've heard about it. I mean, it's great to have the data come back and see everything, but I've really gotten away from those journals one, because I do not like reading them. They're just so bland and boring. But you don't the end find of the scientific journals entertaining. <laughs> oh, I mean, I if it's pertaining to injuries and prehab stuff, like you obviously have to do those because those ones, the, it's in the numbers. You have mm -hmm. to find it in the numbers and see those very minute details. But when it comes to training and getting stronger and everything, most good coaches are keeping track of some sort of parameters that they're testing and pre-testing and, and tracking progress as they go. But you should be able to go through, and if you have an idea, just test it out on yourself. That's, that's the perfect way to do it. And I like what you said about your assistant. Like You can have a coach's eye for it, but you can also have a coach's feel. So even if you're not training as much as someone else on staff, if you find a way to perfect your coaching style and perfect the way that you can impact your athletes maybe in a different way, that's, that's even better because you bring something else to the staff rather than both of you, everybody on staff being a hey, staff lift meathead time. The amount of time I spend under, under a barbell, I have never seen one person go back and forth over one slow-mo clip just over and over again, just looking how someone moves and being like, okay, and, right, and taking notes the whole time. And I'm like, and, and for us, I'm like, that's how I think about my training. Like, I'm, I'll watch my own training and think, okay, what did I do that time? How did it work? She is meticulous about it. It's, it's impressive. That's the only way I can put it. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I film my stuff, so it's definitely something that I think comes in handy, especially when you train by yourself, to be able to see, see those things because you have an envision of how it feels, how you think you look but to be able to replay it and see, all right, this is plain day. This is what it actually looked like. like Ooh. <laughs> yeah, my back was way rounded on that. That's Sometimes it hurts your heart. I, like, I thought that was so pretty, yeah. but it was not. 
<laughs> Usually the not in my case. Hey, so we end the show like any good training session with a finisher. Okay. So we got four questions, four quarters. All right. And maybe over time. Okay. Okay. Per- I like perfect it. Perfect for the basketball player in you. So you can answer them as quick as you want, or you can expand on them. But all right, here we go. Biggest influence in strength and conditioning and favorite athlete growing up. Oof. Uh, biggest influence in strength and conditioning? Probably Carl, to be honest. Like, <laughs> if I have to be completely honest. And then favorite athlete growing up, hands down, Shaquille O'Neal. Shaquille O'Neal is the reason I know how to multiply. Shaquille There's a story O'Neal. behind that if we have time. Shaquille O'Neal is my birthday brother, so I always got to give it to him. He's one of the best people on the planet, hands down. <laughs> uh, go, go ahead with it. Go ahead with that story. I'm cool with it. So uh, when I was in third grade, I, that was when I decided I was going to the NBA. So I told my parents, I'm like, what I need to learn math for? I don't need to know how to multiply. I'm going to go play basketball. So my parents at the time knew that I was a huge – this is back when Shaq was on the Orlando Magic. They knew I was a huge Shaq fan. My family grew up in uh, Connecticut – uh, there was a game that fall or the, that winter between the Nets and the Magic. My parents bought tickets. My dad put the tickets into my hand. I'm like, you want to see Shaq? And I'm like, yeah, I want to see Shaq. And then he snatched the tickets away and said, you can go see Shaq when you learn how to multiply. I learned how to multiply in two weeks. I'm like, I'm going to see Shaq. <laughs> That's a perfect lesson. I hope you took that with you when you were teaching in high school. Uh, if, if, if only my, my high school students knew how amazing Shaquille O'Neal was. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So when you're not training, you're not coaching, what can you be found doing? What are your go-to hobbies? My, honestly, watching coaching, watching lifting videos most likely. Uh, if I'm not training and I'm not coaching, um, I, I'm either watching lifting videos or I'm actually, uh, uh, I think I'm a semi-decent cook. Uh, and that's, that's actually one of my favorite things to do. Like when I get home in the afternoon, if I'm not watching videos, I'm trying out a new recipe. I like to cook a little bit, so. Nice. Well, since you do most of your hobbies in coaching, this one might throw you for a loop, but you've had a lot of experience in different careers. If you weren't coaching now, what would you be doing? If I wasn't, most likely I'd probably still be a teacher. Uh, If it weren't for a couple of things that got me out of the profession, um, I I am a giant nerd. I like to say I'm like a meathead nerd. Uh, I love science. Uh, when I was a high school teacher, I actually taught, uh, I taught biology, chemistry. I taught biology, chemistry, physics. And at one point, I even taught integrated science, which was like an, an, a wrap them all up. I love that stuff. If I'm not watching lifting videos, I'm probably watching like science videos, like PBS uh, videos on, on YouTube. Because I like, I like learning about astrophysics because I'm a nerd like that. <laughs> nice. All right. Ideal training day, what's your go-to PR song or playlist and your post-training meal? Uh, so this one is going to – people who know me will be like, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Cell Dweller Imperial March Remix. It's a dubstep version of the Imperial March, and it goes so hard, so hard. Uh, ideal post-training lift. Anything I can cook on, or any an ideal post training meal, anything I can cook on the grill, like some good grilled meat post training session, grilled meat, a tequila based cocktail, can't beat that. And the cocktail is performance enhancing. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, put bacon in it. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Over time, last one for you. Uh, most valuable piece of advice you've received, and then if you want to tell who. <clears throat> most valuable piece of advice that is a a tough one you want to know what the most valuable piece of advice i've ever gotten was uh so when i was a little kid i remember and it was probably when i was playing him in basketball just because my dad's a terrible basketball player and he used to cheat all the damn time but he probably said it at other times too because my dad is from the south and 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 he likes to repeat uh, sayings over and over again but he probably was, we were probably playing basketball. I went up for a shot. He, he hacked me, knocked the shot into the bush. And I was like, that's a foul. That's not fair. And my dad said, who said this was supposed to be fair? Fair is a place where people go to ride rides and eat cotton candy. And I know that's not like specific to lifting, but nobody said this was supposed to be fair. You're going to have to work hard. 
and 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 get what you want out of it. So that's probably the most valuable piece of advice I've ever gotten. What was it? I forgot the second part of the question. No, nah, that was it. You said who it was too. I've yeah. never heard that before. I like that. Yeah. And I, I tell to my athletes sometimes too. Like, coach, that's not fair. Fair is a place where you go to eat, uh, ride rides and eat cotton candy. I'm I'm gonna steal that one. I'm gonna have to quote your dad on it. No, there I like I like that. I mean, anything can be tied back into sport. I think that's the that's the one of the universal truths about it. I think that's why we're we're both kind of drawn to it. Mm -hmm. Hey, but I really appreciate you coming on today, man. It's it's been great to catch up with you and throwing some knowledge bombs at the audience. So hey, again, thanks thanks again for sharing some time with us. Appreciate it, dude. And like I said at the beginning too, it's just it's been great to catch up. And it's nice to have human interaction these days. And it's also nice to have human interaction with people you actually share a, a love with. So it's cool. Awesome, man. Well, thanks again. That's it for this episode of The Strength Game. Thank you again to this week's guest and to our sponsors, Cerberus Strength. Be sure to connect and keep up with our guests at the links in the description below. Remember to subscribe to us on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast provider to stay up to date on all future episodes. Also, check us out on YouTube and CoachOBrian.com, where you can find all the video versions of these episodes, as well as show notes, episode schedule, and much more. Comments, ratings, and reviews are always welcome and appreciated. Thanks again for tuning in, and be sure to join us next week for another great episode of The Strength Game.